So did anybody try the process of prayer that we uh, gave you last week, the uh, oratio, meditatio, no, let's see, no, it's, that's not it, um, <laughs> lectio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. Anybody try that, uh, that process? I you know, this, this, is a, a, this is a participatory class. You guys realize that, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, tried, I tried it, but not enough to really feel like I was getting in the groove with it, but just to practice it a few times. And... Yeah. Okay. We'll uh, follow up on that uh, later. Um, any responses to readings or questions that emerge from our um, past classes or anything that you'd like to begin with? Yeah, I've been wondering if there's a pattern to the to the mystics in, in the uh, as scholars or anybody that's looked at them uh, have determined if they've gone deeper or if they have if, if there are different kinds of uh, insights or uh, images that they mm -hmm. have. Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, those are the maps. That's a, another map that we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, so let me just go into that. And, and again, you know that if you have any questions or any comments, please uh, join in. So we have a wonderful um, spiritual resourcing coordinator, Teresa Westman, and she is constantly finding me materials, overwhelming me. <laughs> no, not really. She's great. So she found a set of books by Carl McCollman. Um, on Christian mysticism, and this particular one, I think, gives us a, another map. Um, in this book, he's saying, okay, it's all right to study it in chronological order, and these folks, um, but what he does is break it down into kind of different categories of mystical expression. So these are his uh, categories. Let me find a... Hold. So, visionaries. And we saw that, we've seen that in a couple of different instances. Uh, um, Hildegard of Bingen being one of those. This really powerful imagery um, that is, again, not hallucinations or anything like that, but it is a imagery in a state of uh, prayer or a state of contemplation um, that emerge um, that um, say something about uh, the spiritual life and the Christian life. Um, so she would, he puts Hildegard in that, uh, in that category. Uh, confessors. And he would put Augustine uh, of Hippo, Augustine of Hippo. And you remember Augustine is the first one who writes a kind of autobiography of his uh, mystical experience. And so he is talking about um, his own experience and what that and how that has uh, uh, transformed his life. Um, lovers. Um, he would put uh, he would put Bernard of Clairvaux that we studied also that had a rich um, love language in a uh, description of his uh, experiences with God, as his experience of this, uh, um, this love. And poets, which uh, he does not put anybody in there that we have studied yet, but we are about to get to several that will in fact qualify uh, for that uh, kind of area. The other is saints. And that doesn't mean for him just people who have been sainted by the Catholic Church, but he distinguishes that as mystics who also um, live the kind of life that is extraordinary um, in its influence uh, in their community or in the larger world. Uh, so it's not just uh, mystical people, it's good people in a very <laughs> deep, profound um, sense. Another character category is heretics <laughs> and he's not saying this as a as a you know as a criticism of them what he's saying is that these folks way of expressing themselves and the thought that came out of their 
mystical experience was so far advanced in many cases, or so unorthodox, um, that they got into trouble uh, for doing that. And we've had several of those that we've seen already. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, uh, John Scotus Eregina, and we have some more to come down the road here in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> also, wisdom keepers. Just getting a good shot of my rear end there. <laughs> <laughs> Can be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can okay. stand on the chair. We'd see wisdom you keepers. <laughs> 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 Keep on the chair. Um, so he would put Pseudo Dionysius in this category, one that we've already looked at, because Pseudo Dionysius is carrying forward, um, he, he's expressing it in new language, but what he is actually carrying forward is um, thought on, on, uh, about God and reality and humanity that comes from a, a, a far um, distant, much more distant. Um, uh, expression than Christianity itself. Uh, mostly he's talking in Neoplatonist kind of uh, language, so he's tying that to a, um, uh, a wisdom tradition beyond just uh, Christianity itself. And so, soul friends, soul friends! <laughs> <laughs> sure y'all get the reference? Uh, <laughs> Nobody that we've looked at yet caught, fall under his category of soul friends, uh, but we're going to see some. And finally, unitives, which I've run out of room. Unitives, which uh, would include, although he although he doesn't put these people in that category, and this is a problem, I think, with, with this kind of scheme, is that some people fall into several of these, not just one. And I would include in there Origen, Heregina, Gregory of Nicaea, and Dionysius that we've already looked at, and we're going to see more and more of those as well. But by the way, one person he puts in that category of unitives is Richard Rohr, also as a unitive. So we're going to look at those. Um, use that as we look at our uh, mystics that we're looking at today and see where they might fall in to those categories. But I'd like to also keep us up on this as far as uh, those being maps that might be useful as we think about the different uh, mystics of our tradition. Yeah. So yes. that's a contemporary author. It is. And he also has another book about um, just mystical experience and mystical practice contemplative practices and things. So it's a good resource. A good resource. Pat? Yes? I know it's jumping ahead, but in what category would he put Thomas Merton? Thomas Merton. Um, might be unitive. Hang on just a second, I'll tell you. I haven't uh, really oh, okay. looked at it, but I've got the categories right here when he's got all the people he's talking about. Seems to so, many, so, many, yeah. so, yeah. so give a little one sentence summary of unitives. Yeah. You were Okay, hang on just a second. I mean you skipped over Bell's question. Um no, what is no. unitives? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I know he's in here. <coughs> it's okay. I can wait for the answer one. No. <laughs> Um, I know he's got them in here, but I just can't take them out. Um, what is a unitive, though? Okay. We're going to spend a lot of time with uh, Merton, by the way, when we get into the modern uh, contemplative, modern uh, mystics. <clears throat> Remember we talked about this map, where... <clears throat> And this is kind of a classic uh, division of, of mystics that you see in some um, scholars, um, where one is more theistic in the sense of I-thou, relational, uh, separation of us and God, but a deep, um, often kind of relational character of that, uh, even being expressed in very intimate <laughs> and even sexual kind of terms. But another um, approach is more of a unitive kind of uh, approach, um, which that's a great question because it really is uh, almost central 
Um, that a lot of times in the mystical process or in the process of um, uh, contemplative practice, uh, people will move, people have begun with a very I-thou kind of sense of God. And even a sense, uh, you know, in, especially, you know, growing up with the tradition and all that kind of stuff, it's a very anthropomorphic image of God. God is this old man with a beard sitting on the throne, right, <laughs> up in heaven, or some kind of supernatural being, um, if you will, um, that we're having a relationship with. Um, deeper experiences of God tend to begin to deconstruct that, and it can de- it can um, it can <clears throat> it can take away the, the literalization of that. Um, and maintain, nevertheless, a sense of I, thou, but with a more respectful kind of approach to the thou <laughs> as not being this supernatural thing that is judging everything and it is pulling all the strings in the world to make happen what God wants to happen. And they're able then to embrace a broader picture of God um, as being, um, and, and, it, and it's always also a, a uh, there's a degree of mystery with that. You know, there's no mystery with the th- with Thor, the thunder god. <laughs> you know, there is mystery with a sense of God that is beyond our anthropomorphic imaging. That we realize that God is really not that. Um, then we can have a uh, much broader picture of God, um, but it can nevertheless still be a very personal I thou kind of experience. <clears throat> Another thing that can happen in that process, though, is that we begin to lose the distinction because, you know, uh, mystical experience not only challenges our concepts of God, it challenges our concepts of self and what we are and who we are. Um, It's always those go hand in hand. It starts to reconstruct who we think we are. And that can be very liberating in a lot of ways because this ego self that we have constructed, that we think we are, um, can also... um, hold us in bondage <laughs> and can persecute us <laughs> and can drive us nuts. And so when that begins to break down, uh, which real spiritual experience will do, will be, we begin to challenge our notions of what and who we are, then what can happen is that that barrier between us and the divine can become more and more transparent until in some experiences... And this is not just philosophy, okay? This is not just thinking our way to get there. This is through experiences, um, especially contemplative experiences that we're going to be exploring more and more, um, that um, um, the separation is lost altogether. And there's a sense of union with, a sense of realization that what in fact we are is participating in this divine life, that that is an aspect of what and who we are. And those are unitive experiences, and I say it in that way because it's not all the same thing. There's unitive experiences that are still separations to some degree, but so intimate that it's like a lovers lost <laughs> in one another uh, in love. Um, but a unitive experience can also be um, losing the, um, the separation altogether and realizing our own divinity, if you will. And that is a concept that's picked up in the Eastern Church, um, and they run with it (laughs) in the sense that they talk about the divinization of human persons, that that, in fact, is the whole goal of our our, um, spiritual life is to realize um, our own divinity. Um, But also, at the same time, to hold that, hold on to our own humanity as well, not to lose our material, bodily, human existence, but to integrate those two. That's kind of the goal of the human uh, journey. In the West, it's much more of a communion, I, thou kind of uh, mentality. And the mystics that get in trouble in the West are often the mystics that want to talk about this unitive kind of thing. (laughs) And they lose the, in the mind of the church, they lose the respect or the dignity or the distinction between the creator and the creation. And therefore, they're called heretics uh, in the tradition. Yeah, Jim. It's interesting about the distinction between Eastern and Western would have developed because they start at the same source. Yeah, the they Bible do. Bible and New Testament, Paul and Jesus, John, it's full of stuff that identifies the self, God within me. 
Yeah. That sort of yeah. Thing. And there's probably a couple of different reasons for that. One is that, um, you know, some would say, well, the Eastern mindset is just seems to be more <laughs> willing to um, not demand concrete, <laughs> you know, structures and can think beyond those and can be open beyond those. Um, a lot of it, too, is the early church um, leaders and people and teachers in the East um, were often much more mystical-oriented um, kind of folks, um, like the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Okay, They have that whole tradition. And they have a whole listing of uh, fathers of the church or early leaders of the church is different from what we have in the West. Dionysius, probably somebody from Syria that's, that's building these kind of uh, um, ideas about um, uh, unitive experiences of God. So, and in the West, we have, though, very much more of a, because Rome and the authority of Rome and the structure of Rome, you have very much more of a legal, legal orientation to reality. Who's in and who's out, how you structure society, and it was all much more legal, legalized. Um, and, uh, you know, the patristics and the, uh, you know, the slaves and the, it was a much more separate, compartmentalized kind of society and therefore the way they think. I mean, that's, that's you know, kind of the way people think about it. Another one is that the influence of, uh, of Eastern um, traditions like Buddhism and different kind of things like that and Hinduism being closer to those Eastern uh, traditions and, and, and churches um, having much more of an influence on them um, than they did on the West. Yeah, Doug? Well, the Bible as a, as a collection of writings wasn't a product of Jesus or his disciples. It was a product of the Council of Messiah in 331. Is that correct? Well, the canonization, the choice of which, choice, yes. which uh, books would be included are, yes. Yeah. But the writings themselves, though, are um, writings... There are writings um, of, uh, no, we, Jesus never wrote anything, okay? Paul did, uh, but only seven of the 13 books in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul were probably actually written by Paul. Um, everything else after Paul, after 50, well, 60 actually when he's uh, martyred, um, the next writing is in the 70s. Um, and then all the rest of them are after that. Um, so we, these names that we give to the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were added to those Gospels much later. None of those Gospels say, I am John and I'm writing this Gospel. And I'm John, this John. Don't mix, mix me up with the other Johns. <laughs> we don't get that. Um, these names are added to them. And they're added, and they are all, the names that are added are all people who were contemporaries of Jesus, right? Or of Paul. Um, and those, that's not who really wrote those Gospels. Is the Eastern Orthodox Bible more consistent with the Desert Fathers, with the Essenes? No, I mean, they have the same scriptures. Um, you know, they have the same uh, canon. They have the same canon because the canon was produced before the separation, okay? But let me say that, you know, here's one way of saying it um, that I often do, that you have to distinguish the Jesuses, <laughs> There's a historical Jesus of Nazareth who was a human being um, who was a uh, Jewish um, um, uh, you know, person uh, who probably lived in poverty, um, who was uh, maybe a carpenter, but pro probably more, la more <laughs> rightly translating that name, that word, a uh, common laborer, building laborer kind of person, um, who nevertheless was a teacher of wisdom. And if we don't take seriously that historical Jesus, then we lose a lot. Um, but then there is the confessional Jesus, which is the Jesus that the New Testament gives to us, which is the experience of Jesus, of this movement, this spiritual movement called Christianity. People are having experiences of Jesus. And these confessional um, uh, expressions of Jesus are not meant to be historical. They're meant to say this is representational of what Jesus has, is to us and how we have come to understand which is an evolution of understanding, uh, this Jesus in our experience, um, which is a very powerful, then, expression of that. And then later we have the confessional Jesus, which is the, um, did I say the confessional? Yeah. 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 Never mind. We have the, uh, um, no, the, um, I'll, I'll think of the word in a minute. Um, 
in the third century, fourth century, we have the church giving us uh, doctrines about um, Jesus, Jesus' incarnation, the Trinity, all those kind of things. That is a um, um, the confessional, actually, Jesus. Um, but then, <laughs> so those are the, those are at least the three main ones. The, the um, uh, what's the second one called? Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, but there's also other Jesuses through history <laughs> of people interpreting Jesus and what that means. And it's not just Jesus. You've got to distinguish Jesus and Christ as well. Jesus is historical and temporal and limited. Christ is a cosmic uh, expression of the presence of God incarnate in creation. And Richard Rohr uses that uh, language a lot to distinguish those two. Um, Christ, in fact, uh, according to Paul, is in us and uh, being expressed through us. And that's that deification, divinization kind of aspect of the Christian um, experience. That's that unitive experience. Paul himself says, it is no longer I who live, but life in Christ who lives through me. Um, you know, so it, there's that identification to the point of of a unitive kind of experience. We probably spent way too much time on that. Any other questions? <laughs> Doug. Well, one of the things about those exercises from, from last week is that there were various perspectives, some structured, some less structured, or non-structured ways of perceiving the same thing. And I think that's important. You know, even, even Buddhism is... Uh, it has practices. Its yeah. goal is to get to It also has stories. Of unity. It also has poetry. Oh, very much so. It also has, you know, these traditions are, they're trying to say something that can't be said. Not in a systematic, theologic, theological kind of way. We've tried to do that. And it's always deadly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's necessary, though. It's something that brings us down the road. It's something that breaks apart the old models and offers us something new. Um, but the reason so much of our um, religious uh, tradition, and I say that broadly as the human tradition, um, is told in stories and myths and parables and uh, poetry and songs. You know, um, the old Persian texts are, are all songs. But well, we're they, getting better at it. Huh? Well, we're, we're evolving. We're evolving in our process. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning upstairs is that um, um, you can't just chuck the, the, the tradition and the scriptures and all because they are part of a larger flow of the human question um, that can continue to inform us because we are, allow it to continue to grow and to build and to evolve. Um, not because the truth fell out of the sky 2,000 years ago and it's our job to uh, interpret it literally and obey it, um, you know, exactly. That's not, what, that's not what our religion offers us, my God. It's, how deadly is that? You know, it's offering us a creative opportunity to live into the deepest questions of our life. That's what it's offering us. Yeah? Isn't that foundational, though? I don't understand when you're saying we wouldn't throw out the foundations. Well, of course, I mean, to me, of course not. Who would? Well, there's a lot of people who would now. Who would is a and, Christian. And part of it is people who are angry at the Christian message, especially as it's been you know, published in this fundamentalist, judgmental Absolutely. kind of way. Okay. And so okay. they say, yeah, yeah. and so now they back away and say none of it's worth even fooling with because it's too dangerous and too toxic uh, to do that. You know? So it's the swinging of the pendulum. Yeah, but the thing is you can't create a spirituality out of thin air. Okay. You've got to engage the human story and the human stream of what uh, this religious quest has, uh, has given us, recognizing that it can, it's continuing to evolve. Aren't there some parts of it that ought to be? Oh, all of it ought to be. But I mean, when you Well, not about... all of it. I'll, I'll take that back. Not all of it. There's some stuff in that Bible that will well, curl your hair. Some stuff that should be thrown out. <laughs> well, or some stuff that... <laughs> this is some stuff that needs to be kept literalized. I mean, you, we can't water down um, the Ten Commandments, for instance. We can contextualize them, though, and understand what they mean in the context they were originally given us. And recognize that some of our sensibilities about some of those things in those Ten Commandments are very different today. Um, and in fact, um, we're even challenged 
as part of the larger tradition. We have this evolutionary sweep in the Bible itself. <laughs> it's not saying one thing. It's saying multiple things over a long period of time. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's you know, moving from a tribal uh, thunder warrior God to a God that embraces all creation. What? You know, it's no longer just our God. And there's these hints all along the way of do not hold this too tightly because if you do, it'll kill you. Um, Moses says, what's your name, God? And God says, ha, 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 I am who I will be. <laughs> and then they turn that into a name. <laughs> Which is not. <laughs> it's a riddle. <laughs> That's a radical interpretation of Moses. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, 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 I've got one for you. Huh? Oh, do you? What's that? See a burning bush. When you went up on the mountain. He went up on the mountain and burned the sea bush. And burned a bush? And burned a bush. Yeah. Burned some bush. Yeah. I like better, he had a mystical experience um, that uh, is similar to many of these kind of things that they have been seeing. And no, was the burning, was the bush literally burning? Who cares? Or he was on marijuana. <laughs> or he was on marijuana, right? He was smoking the bush. <laughs> that could be it. <laughs> I don't care if the burning bush was literally burning. I mean, you know, the stories about Moses are passed down, but they're not written down until much later. And what the people that are writing them down are trying to express is that Moses had an experience of God. Moses had a mystical experience. And uh, he saw um, something underlying the normal um, view and aspects of, uh, of our reality. And he was open to that to seeing that and to experiencing that. And that led him and his people in a whole new direction toward freedom and toward wholeness. That's how to preach, brother. Uh, <laughs> the old Pentecostal days coming out of me. So let's move into these uh, mystics and talk about, <laughs> talk about some of these ideas. We didn't go into Francis of Assisi, and I want to say a few things about him because he's just such a beautiful figure in the uh, Christian tradition. Um, he grew up, uh, you know, he was uh, kind of the emerging middle class uh, family. They were cloth merchants uh, uh, in Assisi. And uh, so he, was, he grew up a, a, a kind of, a, um, a, a, he had money and he, had, and he loved to go out with his friends and he loved to drink and he loved to fool around and he loved to, you know, he was a young person who was entitled to uh, all these kind of uh, things. And um, at that time, these city-states in Italy were having wars with one another and he got involved in one of those and he got wounded. And well, no, he didn't get wounded, he got captured. And uh, he was in prison for like a year. And shortly after he was released, he came down deathly ill, uh, very close to death. And through that experience had a transformation, um, which is often the case. Uh, it's often things like war and sickness and loss that strip away our dependency on that kind of ego identity and that kind of what we think life is supposed to be. Um, that opens us and makes us vulnerable to these kinds of uh, experience. And um, we don't have a lot of writing, original writing from St. Francis. We have a lot of people writing about him and, and writing this is what he said. Um, and a lot of the things that you go to the quotes of St. Francis and you know, it's kind of dubious as to which ones were actually, he actually said. But one of the most famous uh, uh, poems he's known for is The Canticle of the Sun. And so oh, let, me, let me say this, that um, this guy, Coleman, puts him as a um, saint, which he was. Um, but I would say that he was also a poet, a lover, and a soul friend. All right? So... Um, this Canticle of the Sun uh, we read, um, you had in your readings, um, which is a beautiful expression, and it's a very visionary kind of expression. It's a very much a kind of subtle consciousness kind of expression, all right? Um, and uh, it also shows his sense then of connection to um, uh, nature as the abiding uh, presence of God. And or nature abiding in God, again pantheism, panentheism, 
And a lot of these people will skirt that little piece too about God's presence in all of creation and sometimes get in trouble uh, for that as well. Um, so he has a visionary experience at the Church of St. Damien. Um, he sees the crucified Christ on the altar uh, come to life uh, and he has a conversation uh, with him. Um, he asks him, uh, Christ asks him to dedicate himself to a new way of life. This is again right after he's recovered from the sickness and um, so he is having these kind of visionary experiences that are, again, engaging the senses and the imagination. That's that subtle kind of uh, consciousness, okay? Um, and then he has another visionary experience where he devotes himself to lady poverty. Um, so he takes a vow of poverty. And this is, again, remember his background, his uh, history. He takes this vow of poverty as being this essential way um, that we concentrate our uh, attention um, on this intention of being open to this deeper reality. And with, um, with him, we don't see this kind of extreme asceticism of, uh, you know, that we saw like in the Desert Fathers, uh, this kind of uh, uh, body-harming kind of ascetic poverty. Uh, for him, it's much more as simply as a way to drop the distractions and concentrate on um, what he thinks is essential uh, to uh, the, the, um, the spiritual experience. One of his followers, uh, uh, Jacopone uh, da Todi, um, put it very well. He said, poverty is, not to poverty is not to have and nothing to desire and all things to possess in the spirit of liberty. And again, another one of his thing, great themes is that God is present and speaks in creation. So in the canticle, we hear about uh, brother sun and sister moon and, uh, and uh, brother wind and fire and sister mother earth and beautiful language um, describing that. His monastic order was um, um, approved by the uh, Pope in 1210. They were the poor little brothers and the poor Claire's. <laughs> Claire was a um, noble woman who supported um, um, uh, Francis's uh, work and ministry and became uh, somewhat of a spiritual figure and nun herself um, in the process. But there was also a part of this order that were called the tertiaries, who were not nuns and priests, but were people living their lives in the world with families, with jobs, with, you know, uh, the, the things that people do in the world, but nevertheless wanted a deeper devotional life. And so now we're beginning to see more and more of that. Remember we talked about the Beguins um, and the Beggards. Um, these are people who are not necessarily taking up, uh, they're certainly not taking up the priesthood, but they're not taking up um, uh, monastic style of life, styles of life either. Um, but they are nevertheless dedicated to this uh, course of spiritual uh, enrichment. So they're moving beyond both monastic isolation and uh, ecclesiastical control <laughs> and authority uh, as well, which is, again, another trending thing um, that's happening in, uh, in society. So any questions about, uh, about Francis? So Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> he's kind of a bridge between the medieval and early <laughs> modern, really, uh, because he's a very systematic thinker. And uh, he's kind of an odd figure. He's hard, hard to figure out because his main work is called the Summa Theologia, which is a scholastic kind of um, um, systematic theology based on the um, philosophy of Aristotle, which has just recently been reinvented into the West uh, through the Muslims, actually. And um, so he's kind of taking the Platonic platform away and placing, uh, interpreting Christianity more in an in a Aristotelian fashion, which means much more in an objective type of, uh, of, of fashion. Um, that's what Aristotle was about. And so we see, are seeing the emergence of a more objective and even scientific approach, a more rational approach to consciousness and reality. Um, this is where we're moving into, from the mythic to the rational and their society. We've already seen some of this, in, in fact, in Hildegard of Bingen. 
um, who was very ob objectively minded too in her study of science and herbs and biology and different kind of things like that. And that is beginning to affect also then um, their mysticism <laughs> and how their mysticism gets expressed. And so even though Aquinas was this kind of scholastic kind of mind, um, nevertheless, scratch the surface and sure enough, there's a mystic because uh, <laughs> he's talking about some of his mystical experiences. And I hope you enjoyed the readings from him um, about the, uh, the squirrel trying to make love to a tiger or something like that. Um, <laughs> that was pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Well, that's not the one I got. I don't have the one for this. Did I miss the one? I completely missed the one. Anyway, so uh, he has, uses this very, um, he uses a lot of visionary kind of uh, language as well. <clears throat> Although his theology is very systematic and very rational, underlying it is still this sense of knowledge, noose, or um, knowledge that is beyond just rational knowledge. And also the idea of uh, sapientia that is a wisdom knowing, a, a wisdom kind of a thing, not just a rational um, kind of thing. Um, when asked to resume uh, his summa, um, to finish the writing of it, uh, he replied that everything he had written seemed like straw in comparison with what contemplation had revealed to him. And this is later uh, in his life. <clears throat> He also has a great stress on combining the life of contemplation with the life of action. Um, he believes that somebody to cloister themselves away from the world and not engage the world, which will later be called quietism, um, is not the appropriate expression of, um, of our spirituality. Um, that to engage, to take what we are receiving in our experience of God and to take it into the world um, in whatever ways that we are... Um, made to do that um, is a higher perfection in love um, than merely sitting and, and uh, admiring God. And that's what a lot of them teach. It's not just about nasal gazing, which has a, no history, a whole history to that term. We'll follow up that, with that later. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I like to give teasers. <laughs> So Aquinas is called a saint by this uh, model, but I would say that he's also a wisdom keeper, and that he is carrying forward, especially in the philosophy of Aristotle, carrying that forward in a new form in Christian interpretation. So Meister Eckhart. <coughs> Meister Eckhart is one of my favorites. <laughs> he was a German um, uh, monk. Um, he was a Dominican monk. Um, lived in the 13th and 14th century. <clears throat> this uh, model lists him as a heretic, <laughs> but I would say more than that, he's a unitive. Um, he really gives us a unitive vision of God and, and humanity. Um, he was from a noble family. He had a lot of uh, uh, benefits of education and upbringing and those kind of things. Um, he, uh, again, was in the Mon Dominican order, and he rose to high levels uh, in, uh, in his own low order. He was an active um, um, uh, monastery leader. Um, but where he really shone was in academia. Um, he was a teacher. Um, he taught in Paris and Strasbourg and Cologne, some of the top schools um, in his age. And the Meister part of his name is reference to his masters uh, in those, in theology and in those fields. Um, in his readings, uh, he talks, the ones that you read, hopefully, um, he talks about the mysterious word and darkness out of which we are born. Here's another one of those mystics talking and using the language of darkness um, to talk about the contemplative experience. What they're talking at from is not, again, a, a, a philosophical um, um, uh, you know, program, they're talking about it as an experience. So when the mind is able to come to a contemplative place where all the stuff uh, drops away, um, its experience is kind of a, a darkness or a void or experience uh, that also is, that doesn't carry all those uh, ideas about God uh, that we've been taught and grown up with and that the church has given us. It's not that those are bad. He's not saying that. 
But in that kind of state of consciousness, which is this causal state, um, all of that doesn't matter because we're encountering something that is real, that is um, more than all of that. And maybe less than all of that in the sense of all of that doesn't uh, speak uh, the way it used to speak. So he says, call it if you will. Uh, well, he contrasts normal, the normal intellect and understanding with a different kind of knowledge and knowing. And he says, call it if you will an ignorance, an unknowing, an outward ignorance that lures and attracts you from all understood things and from yourself and from your understanding of yourself. Uh, it completely opens all of that kind of stuff up. Um, he also, in our reading, talked to this wonderful writing that's often quoted from him about dwelling in the ground, the bottom, the stream, in the source of the Godhead. Again, that's that place where all the images um, are no longer uh, needed. Uh, that place where God ceases to become, um, where God ceases to become manifest, um, to the God is uncreated, unmanifest. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the moment I flowed out from the Creator, all creatures stood up and shouted, Behold, here is God. And he says, What is God? God, isness is God, being is God. Creation is the flowing out of the isness from God. And that is why God becomes where any creature, that's, and that is why God becomes where any creature expresses God. And I hope you see the delicacy here <laughs> of holding together um, this sense of um, this reality that we call God, among other things, that is beyond um, definition that is ultimately eternal and, uh, and infinite, um, that does not fit any of our categories, um, that Dionysius says is not this, is not that, um, that you can't say what God is, you can only say what God is not, um, coming to this place where uh, of being able to experience that, but that does not then take us out of our, or disqualify our bodily, material, temporal existence. In fact, it then recognizes that that flows out of that very nothing, flows out everything. And to be able to experience both of those as God um, is kind of the, um, um, the completeness of the uh, spiritual experience. Um, and we find this in Eastern religion a lot uh, as well. The, the formula goes like this. Um, <clears throat> um, leave everything... Uh, to find the one, and having found the one, embrace everything as the one. That's kind of the way of thinking about it. You know? um, and again, there's been a lot of folks in different traditions that have gone one or the other direction and left out the other. And that becomes a lopsided sort of thing that can lead to a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. So um, he distinguishes between the Godhead and God. The Godhead was a way for him to say this thing that can't be named. And God is all of our ways of, of, of talking about God. Nevertheless, all those images of God, like the Trinity and things like that, issue out of the Godhead. So it's not like these are false and this is real. These are expressions of the greater reality. All right. So. <laughs> you get this? Yeah. Yeah. Is Christ the or the person that the story is about washing dishes in the kitchen. And somebody says, well, you know, why is a man of this height doing in the kitchen washing dishes? He said, that's, that's I find God washing dishes. That's, is that the one? I don't know that story, but there's interesting. There's a uh, similar story about Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a great uh, Vietnamese Buddhist uh, teacher. Um, that he'll, his students would say he would often come to us when we were chopping carrots or washing dishes and say, um, where are you? <laughs> was, where was their mind while they were doing, they were, were you pre, are you present, in other words, um, is a way of saying that. And that's another, you know, part, expression of this mystical, and we'll, we'll get into that, of being present to what 
ever then is emerging in life. What that gives us, that sense of that deeper reality gives us the courage, I guess, or the awareness to be able to um, not con be in control of our everything, but a much more, uh, what's the Buddhist word? Um, um, acceptance and availability to whatever emerges in our life. And again, that's not quietism. That's not uh, disengaging from life. That's being able to engage life in a much freer uh, and fuller fashion then. Um, even if we, you know, sometimes get crucified for doing that, but, you know. <clears throat> he also had a very incarnational view of humanity, um, that Christ became not, uh, Christ became man, not a man, is the way he expresses it. That incarnation is more than just about the phenomenon of Jesus Christ, but this Christ reality is part of all of our in fact, uh, realities. Our nature and Christ's nature is not different, is what he says. <clears throat> and so we can experience union with God through the indestructible faculty of the soul. There is an aspect of our very existence that is already structured to be, to <laughs> commune with and have this experience with and to be able to realize God uh, in our experience. And he referred to it as the divine spark or the um, inner light, and the citadel of the soul. And uh, Eckhart wrote uh, treatises in Latin, um, whole theological treatises um, that reflect a lot of his experience, but his best writing is actually in his sermons um, that he wrote in German, that he wrote in the vernacular, that he was preaching to the people of his parish. And in those sermons, he's trying to put into imagery and metaphor these experiences and these ideas about those experiences uh, with God. And in doing so, trying to explain the inexplainable and trying to express that, that's where he gets in trouble because he gets misinterpreted by the authorities and, uh, and they bring him up uh, on charges of heresy. So in 1326, Archbishop of Cologne, who was, by the way, a Franciscan bishop, and the Franciscans and the um, Dominicans didn't always get along, and uh, <laughs> the bishop began proceedings against Eckhart. And, uh, but Eckhart was preparing his defense, and, but he died the year uh, in 1325 before the judgment was made. Um, but in 1329, the Pope condemned several of Eckhart's uh, proclamations as heretical, and that stands uh, to this day. Uh, even though there's been a lot of talk about trying to reinstate and those kind of things. There's people in the Catholic Church that still believe he's a, her a heretic, so, you know, <laughs> it doesn't help. Um, <laughs> so we've got a couple of books. I again want to introduce you to some resources. And we have, and I've, we've got, as we go on, I've, I've got a lot more for you. But these are some great uh, books on Meister Eckhart that we have. This one is much more of a kind of scholarly work um, that gives you all the kind of technical stuff about him and his thought. Um, this is my favorite, Meister Eckhart, Mysticus Theologian by Robert uh, Foreman. Robert Foreman has written extensively on uh, human consciousness and, um, and is a mystic in his own right. Um, and his book I thought was, uh, was excellent uh, in regard to that. So any questions about Eckhart? He's kind of a difficult person to read because, again, I would encourage you to read his uh, sermons and they can be uh, difficult, but, um, um, but in, in those especially, you get a lot of his imagery and metaphor and things like that. Uh, his Latin pieces are very difficult uh, to read. But folks like For, uh, Foreman can give you kind of the insight into his central kind of ideas and experience, uh, what he's talking about. So that is a very unitive expression, right, um, of ours, that we are, in fact, um, have something of us that uh, participates and shares in and is the divine life. So, does somebody else see a hand up? Or? I, I was, it was me. I was just wondering if you'd say the author of the Christian mystics, mythics? Yes. Myth, the book, the one that's right there. Yeah, I'll leave it up here. So, uh, Carl McCollman. Oh, thank you. Carl McCollman. All right. So, the mm -hmm. practice I want to encourage you in. Um, if you notice, we've been kind of working on a, on a path here in the practices that we've been talking about. Um, very much from cataphatic um, with 
um, speech <laughs> to apophatic without speech. Very much from um, subtle uh, to causal. Um, again, you can meditate on stories from the Bible, images. You can meditate on um, the wounds of Christ, uh, which was very big in the middle <laughs> medieval days. Um, the the uh, bleeding heart or burning heart of Christ. You can you know you can do do this imagery thing, and we're going to see some of the ones that one of the some of the mystics we're talking about here um, in the next couple of days. Um, are very emphatic that those are important and those can be helpful, but ultimately um, there's a deeper uh, practice. And that practice is coming to a simple openness and uh, um, submission to, that's probably not a good word, um, but surrender to uh, just the, uh, the mystery itself and being willing to be present to that, being willing to allow um, our um, imaginative and... Uh, you know, thought process to uh, uh, to settle down and to uh, enter that space of darkness and emptiness and unknowing and not needing to know and being present to that. Um, a way that that's practiced in Christian prayer is a contemplative practice called centering prayer, um, which we do every Wednesday here uh, at the church on Wednesday mornings. And it is a... Um, uh, an attempt to spend 20 minutes in silence <clears throat> and in that silence to um, try to um, not blank out, that's not the point, but to, but to be open and attentive to uh, the mystery, if you will. And uh, that's difficult if you've done any form of what's usually called meditation. Um, but one of the practices in centering prayer is you choose a word, a centering word. Um, it can be Christ, it can be love, it can be, mine is simply yes. Um, it can be, you know, it should be one or two syllables, something simple. And you shouldn't, you know, it's something that's not going to, you're going to spend your time meditating on that word. <laughs> what does that word mean? And how does that, and, you know, and once you get that word, the intention is also not to chant that word or to repeat that word continuously in your mind. Um, but as you, um, sit in silence with that intention of being available um, to the mystery. Um, when you find yourself wandering off uh, with thought or with a concern or a worry or a memory, or whatever it is, you return to that word, you know, yes, yes, or love, uh, peace. And that just reminds you to, okay, be open again, don't go down that road or that road, be open again. Uh, Thomas Keating is one of the great teachers of this uh, practice. Uh, and uh, Keating says that it's like you're on a, sitting on a bank and watching boats go by. And because uh, stuff will come into your consciousness. So again, the point is not to blank things out, but to let the boat pass. And occasionally you'll find your, that you have gotten on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and when you realize that you've gotten on the boat, <laughs> Use the centering word to return to the shore, to return to your original intention of just being available um, and practice that. Um, you know, for a lot of people, this is very, this seems like dangerous stuff for a lot of Christians um, because it seems like that opens your consciousness up to something evil or something, you know, un unwelcomed or something dangerous. Um, and so a lot of prayer, uh, prayer that's taught in church is full of activity and imagery and uh, all this kind of stuff. And we're going to say the, the needs of all the things that have been, you know, mentioned in prayer. We're going to do this, we're going to do this. And it becomes very um, cataphatic, <laughs> you know. And most, many, I would say most Christians have a very difficult time letting that drop and get to this place where we are just naked and vulnerable before the mystery of our very existence and being willing to attend to that um, for a period of time. And uh, the form is just simply sitting in a chair comfortably where you're not distracted by your discomfort and spending, uh, beginning with maybe five minutes of doing that and maybe working up to 10, 15, 20. You'll find that it takes at least five minutes to clear out all the cobwebs <laughs> and to really kind of get... Uh, uh, get to the process. Um, so I would invite you to try that. 
um, experience. If you've not tried it before, or try it if you have tried it before. Or come to our Wednesday morning uh, <laughs> session, which is at 8.30 on Wednesday mornings. And we do about 10 minutes of kind of how are we doing, what's, some instructions sometimes, and then uh, 20 minutes of silence. That's what we do. All right?